split the talk into three sections. Uh, look at the, the grounds and see how they have shrunk over the years. Uh, look at the mound, take my um, life in my hands there, and then look at the house itself at the end. So if we start off, we're looking at the grounds. Now, this map here that I, I want to use, this is um, an imagination of Wickham in the medieval period, long before the house was built. But I put it up for um, two or three reasons. The area that's outlined in green is where the house and grounds are. Um, and the reason it's important is that in, these, in the med medieval period, it was clearly outside of Wickham. The land was owned by the nuns at Godstow Convent in Oxford. Um, they were given it by King Henry II, and they hung on to it until it was taken away by King Henry VIII, when he shut down the monasteries and convents and so on. So it is, it is outside of Wickham at, at this sort of stage. Um, interesting that in the grounds there is the Castle Hill, the site of the old castle put there, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, and something that I always find quite fascinating, although not directly related, um, I've outlined in blue this medieval trackway, which comes from somewhere near where Morrison's is now, and gives you a direct route straight to the church, the, the parish church. Um, it comes into play two or three times. Uh, exactly how old it is, I don't know, but certainly it's been around for a long time. Um, so just jumping forward to what we really want to see, in the middle of the 19th century, this is what we reckon the grounds looked like. Now, Castle Hill is not a stately home. It didn't own half of South Buckinghamshire or anything like that. Uh, and we don't have a rich archive of plans and maps. But we do know that land has been sold off over the years. And so by adding back the land that we know has been sold off, we get this sort of picture here. Um, the driveway used to go right down to the bottom of Amersham Hill. Um, one of the stories is if you come out of the railway station now, what used to be a pub straight in front of you, which I think is now boarded up, um, that used to be, so it said, effectively the gatehouse. So the driveway used to come out there. Um, in the 1860s, the railway was pushed through to Princess Risborough. They needed to build a cutting, and so they bought, as you can see, something like the bottom quarter, the southern quarter of Castle Hill's land. So that was the first chunk to go. It, of course, left a question mark of to how you get out of the house. And so I've put in yellow there where the driveway went. So it still was a part of Amersham Hill. That was the address. But instead of being at the bottom, you now came out just uh, north of the railway. Then in the 1870s, that big chunk on the east was sold off, which left us with this sort of structure until the 1900s. Now, in the 1870s and right through till about the late 1890s, that trackway I showed you from Morrison's down to the church was still there. In fact, it's the reason why there is that footbridge over the railway. Right? You may know if you come out of Castle Hill House now and turn right, just at the end, on your left, there is a footbridge. That footbridge was there to enable the trackway to kept to uh, be in use. In around about 1900, the decision was made to develop this side, our side, north of the railway. Um, the road that had been called Cemetery Road was renamed Priory Road, and the trackway was developed into a road that was given the name Priory Avenue. Now, of course, if it just followed the, uh, the path of the original trackway, it would have gone as far as the footbridge and stopped. But they didn't want to do that. They pushed it through, as you can see on this map here, they pushed it through along the northern edge of the railway, which means, of course, it subsumed that part of Castle Hill's driveway 
that connected Castle Hill House to Amersham Hill. So uh, when this was done, for the first time ever, Castle Hill House was cut off from Amersham Hill, and of course we still are. Um, in the 1960s, the whole lot was sold to Wickham District Council. In the 1970s, the last two chunks of land were sold off. The area behind the house, which is now Haystacks, and a little bit in the southwest corner for the new vicarage, which means that what we're left with is that, compared with what we roughly think we had, which is the, the outlined area. And of course, the driveway, as you can see, just takes us down to the corner, and that's where we are now. So that gives you a, a sort of feel as to sort of how much the area of land with the house has diminished over the years. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the mound for a bit now. Now, as, as those linked with the museum and who've been linked with the museum for a long time will know, this is something of a taboo subject because it's really quite controversial. There are various views and we can get into all sorts of difficulties. I'm going to try to avoid being controversial um, and I hope that if people don't uh, agree totally with what I'm going to say, um, at least they understand I'm not deliberately being offensive. Okay, so what I mean by the mound is this here. Um, and one of the things that does surprise me, and I suppose I shouldn't be surprised because we don't talk about it very much, um, is the number of people who actually visit the house, the museum, and don't even realise there is a mound there. Well, there it is. Um, it is officially, and I use the word officially, deliberately, um, what is known as a mot. In the Norman times, one of the first things the Normans did was to cover with literally hundreds of watchtowers. These were piles of basically turf. I think the word mot is actually old French for turf, um, piled up. And so you've got a, a great mound on top of which you put a building. And that building said two things. One, we are here, we are powerful, we are important. And secondly, and we can see what you are doing. Um, around the bottom, it enclosed the mot was known as the bailey, and that was enclosed by a bank and ditch. Now, as I said, there were hundreds of these things. Some were very grand with stone walls and stone buildings. Some were much more modest with just wooden fences and wooden buildings. Uh, they were not at this stage really castles. They weren't built to withstand sieges and battering rams. But about 50 years later, when we had the, uh, what we call the, the anarchy, the period of Stephen and Matilda's uh, war, then it became much more serious. It was a proper war. There were armies, there were battles, and we needed castles. Um, and so places like Desborough Castle, on the outskirts of Wickham, which had been an Iron Age fort, were taken over and developed. So this is officially, um, and uh, you can see if you're interested in looking and looking at the details of it, on the Schedule Monument list, the number I've put on the screen there, it's 1009537, that will give you a description of what English heritage think this thing is and why they've scheduled it. Um, and by scheduling it, of course, it gives us a duty of care. We have to preserve and protect it. But there are question marks. For example, um, if all of the activity in Norman times was centred around Desborough, then what makes us think that this is Norman at all? Uh, there is a list of Norman structures and we're not on it. Uh, nothing ostensibly and deliberately proven Norman has ever been found here. So we're left with a bit of a dilemma because some people will take the view that that proves conclusively that this is not Norman, it shouldn't be scheduled, um, and I've even been told to my face that I have got to go to Hannah and tell her to stop using the word mot. Um, personally, I think that's going too far. Um, it does raise question marks, but it doesn't prove anything. It's incredibly difficult in archaeology to prove a negative. 
I was looking at a study done in Northern England recently um, into Norman structures and of 300 structures, they were only able to prove that eight were not Norman because it's incredibly difficult to. Um, the idea that it's not on a list. I was once told by uh, an archeologist to be very wary of anybody that uses a list to prove a negative. Now, if I can give you just a very silly, simple example of, of what he meant, um, I'm sure somewhere there is a list of all the people, all the drivers who exceeded the speed limit in August. Uh, I am not on that list. Does that therefore prove conclusively that I was law abiding throughout the whole of August or was I just lucky? You see the point, you know, just because you are not on a list doesn't actually prove anything. Um, and the fact that we've not found anything Norman is basically because we've not looked for it. So what can we do? Are there any ways we can resolve this issue? Well, the first thing that we can't do, it would be lovely to do it, would be to excavate. It's a scheduled monument. If you were going to excavate it, you would have to get to that very precise moment in time when the very first strip of turf was cut. That would mean digging right down into the heart of it, risking damaging and destabilizing it. You will not be allowed to do that. So can we prove that perhaps it was something else? Well, this is a list of all the suggestions as to what it might be. Um, it's not my list, let me stress immediately, I haven't come up with this, but these are suggestions that people have made over the last two or three hundred years as to what it is. Some people think it might even be earlier than Norman. It might be Norman. Is it Roman? Is it actually just a pile of rubble? Is it only a garden feature? And the big problem with all of this is actually evidence. The only thing we can prove conclusively, it is not anything to do with the railway. The last example there is clearly wrong. And we know that because we have a description of the mound in the 1830s and the railway was not pushed through to Princess Risborough until the 1860s. So you can definitely rule out the rest. All the rest, you can think one way, you can think the other. One of the favorite um, suggestions, for example, is that it's nothing important, it's just a landscape garden feature. I have serious doubts about that, um, purely because uh, some of you may remember Time Team, the television program on archaeology. I used to like Stuart, who was the landscape archaeologist, who just went around looking at things. And when I look at this mound, I just think it's too big. It's also in completely the wrong place. Would you really put something that big right up against the end of your house so it blocks all the daylight and moreover you can't actually see it if you're inside the house it seems very unlikely but then as i'm always the first to admit i think the charge of the light brigade was very unlikely but it didn't stop it happening and this is the problem um, basically we have no proof uh, and just to compound things one of the studies i made said of course these structures were constantly being reused. You know, it might actually be an ancient monument, an ancient barrow, and then when the Normans came and decided they wanted a mot, they thought, oh look, there's one already built for us. And of course it's definitely been used as a garden feature. After all, we still use it as one ourselves now, don't we? So, you know, where does that leave us? Because it's very confusing and very uncertain. Well, I think we have to be honest and say that nobody really knows. We know why it has been scheduled, but there are question marks over that. So no one knows for sure what it was or what it was not. But I do think, and as we saw on that, that previous list of possibilities, it's actually quite interesting to, to, to say to people, well, okay, go up and have a look. You might be standing on something that's been there for a thousand years. What do you think it might be? The one thing that I would, I, I, I would disagree with quite strongly would be any suggestion that it should be removed from the scheduled list. Because whatever it might or might not be, as long as it is scheduled, it's protected. 
Um, and to me, I'm, I'm happy with that. So there are some thoughts about the mound. Um, uh, as I say, there will be people who, who have different views, but I, I've tried to be fairly balanced about uh, what it might be, what it might not be, um, and let's just be open, but at least let's preserve it for future generations. So I hope I've been able to say a few things without offending anyone too much there. Um, let's uh, go on to what we're really here about, the house itself, Castle Hill House. Now, um, I, I want to be, be clear, we're not overstating the importance of this. This is not a stately home. It's not on a par with West Wickham or Hugh and Man. But we are very lucky because the original house is, if you know where to look for it, it's, it's almost all there. Um, and these photographs that I took at the back show you what I mean. The northwest corner is pretty well as it was when the house was first built. The northeast corner, well, we've lost the east wall. That was knocked down about 100 years ago. So we roughly know where the, the, the corner was. The area that I've lightly shaded in green, which is where the toilets and the staff kitchen are now, um, that was not original. That was only added about 200 years ago. But you can see from the line drawing on the left that this was really a very simple structure. Basically, it was a front door into a sort of hallway with a back door at the back. On the left was the kitchen, which is where it still is to this day. On the right was a, a living room. And then there was a flight of stairs that took you up to the back. Um, the picture I put in the middle, some of you may recognize, um, it's inside that green area. If you have been to the staff kitchen or whatever and you are going back into the main building, you'll use the door that's open, which takes you into the kitchen. To the left is this door that takes you really just into the stairs down to the basement. But it's a rather grand door just to let you into the basement. And it looks very much as if that might have been the original back door. So what can we say about it? Do, can, we, can we get any idea what the house really looked like? Well, this is a picture of a house, a genuine house. It still stands. Um, it's actually in Winchester. But it looks very, very much like what our house must have looked like. Three stories, um, a, a, a habitable attic, always spelt with a K, by the way, A-T-T-I-C-K, um, and a very simple structure with that absolutely gorgeous, I do love the clay tile roof, particularly on a sunny day. The brown is, is just a stunning colour. Um, I've borrowed that picture just to try to give you an idea what it looks like. And I say that, if you know where to look for it, is really still there. Because all we've done really is stuck a bit on the front of it and a bit on the eastern end of it. We, we haven't even changed, changed the roof line. So that's what I reckon it was. We don't have a date for building. This building was a 17th century building. So by similarity, um, probably early 17th century when the first Castle Hill house was put up. looking something like that. This is the first picture we have of the house and this is after the front had been added to it and you can see immediately it looks very very different. The original house, two floors plus the attic, so three habitable floors, relatively low ceilings. Here in the early 19th century they wanted to impress people and remember this is before the railways this was a very imposing site in Wickham you could look over Wickham from here and people in Wickham could look up both physically and metaphorically to this house so he wanted something impressive and so they made it so the rooms are bigger they're not wider or longer but they are definitely taller and you can see that from the windows. This picture is a bit of artistic license. The, the windows are artificially stretched vertically but it's a pretty good idea. Um, there's also uh, a picture of the house from the back which also has a bit of artistic license because it, uh, it, it shows the church in a position where the church 
can't possibly be. But this is a little bit, you know, this is the earliest picture that we found of it. And if you see the line drawings on, on the top line drawing, just literally adds on the front much the same three rooms as you had on the back. There's an entrance hall, a room on the left, a room on the right. Um, but at the bottom, then you've got this extension that was put on the back, which was basically for the staff. So there's the butler's room, there's the pantry and so on. But you can see also that at this time they blocked up the back door and knocked a new back door through the kitchen. And I find this really, really interesting. I'm sure you've heard of the expression, you may even have seen the television program, upstairs, downstairs, which was very much a reflection of upper class Victorian society, where the owners and the, 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 the richer people would enter a house, they would go up a flight of steps, that was their living area, and their bedrooms were up above, whereas the staff would go downstairs um, and their working area was basically in the basement with a bit of daylight. Now, Castle Hill never had that. This is not an upstairs, downstairs house. But to me, it is very much a front door, back door house. Because in the original house, where you just had this one entrance hall, whoever you were, whether you went in the front door or the back door, you always went into that middle space. But by the time they have made the changes to the house here, you could very much separate out people who were coming to the front door to meet the owners of the house who lived there. They would welcome you in the front door, the hall, take you into their living room, whereas the staff, the tradesmen, the tinkers, etc., they had their own back door, which would let them into the kitchen, and only if they needed to, because they were looking after the fireplaces or whatever, did they actually come into contact with the rest of the house. So it seems to me that you've got very much, okay, I say upstairs, downstairs, but turned horizontally um, as a, a, a reflection of society in the 19th century that we have here. This is where I say, you know, I find the house really fascinating, okay? Um, just to, to, to sort of reiterate the point, this is a picture I took of the entrance hall. Um, and, and the thing to see, most obviously, is the difference in ceiling height. Uh, you, I'm sure you will know that if you go upstairs, to get from the back to the front of the house, upstairs, there's a little flight of steps. Well, that little flight of steps has to be there because downstairs, where we are here, the ceiling at the front of the house is much higher than the ceiling at the back of the house in order to give this much more airy view. Um, I've sort of put in yellow where the original back door would have been, but of course by now it's blocked off because the back door is that door into and out of the kitchen. Um, the staircase I've called bent because originally the staircase went straight down into the into the living room. If you go into the shop now from the um, from the reception area and immediately look on your left in the corner you'll see uh, a cupboard an open cupboard with a, a curved top and some very shallow three or four inch shelves that almost certainly was the doorway that led to the staircase to take you upstairs originally but it was blocked off here uh, i mean the staircase is still incredibly steep and incredibly narrow i i, I do feel incredibly sorry for some of those victorian ladies with their enormous skirts and things, how they manage to na navigate the stairs um, with a sense of decorum, I don't know. But anyway, that, that um, is their, 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 their problem, I'm afraid. But there we are, that's just trying to give. It's also why, and it confuses people sometimes, when we put the lift in, uh, we say there's a ground floor, a first floor and a second floor. Because of course the ground floor is the ground floor. The first floor is the lower level upstairs at the back, and the second floor has to be the higher level upstairs at the front. So you can see this, 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 this way that the uh, changes have reflected. Now, I said um, earlier on about the mound, that we have a description of the mound in the 1830s. Now, I'm not going to read this all out to you. Um, I've deliberately put it on here. I know this is being recorded. So if you want to read this 
at your own pace, then fine, feel, feel free to do so. It's a description of the house when it was put up for auction in 1833. Um, I'm going to pick out just one or two things. One of the things that it stresses is just how far you can see from the house. They're talking about being able to see Woburn, West Wickham, Hewenden, even out towards Hamden, a vast area, which of course these days you can't see because of the buildings and the trees, but it, you could see an awful long way in those days. Um, outbuildings, um, it talks about, uh, and I say 1830s, it talks about the coach house, this is obviously where the learning rooms are now, harness room, a three-stall stable, a yard, a cow house and a piggery. So there was still an element of, of, of um, small holding farming going on there, uh, maybe just self-sufficiency, providing your own beef and pork. So um, I say if you want to read it all, which will give you an interesting description, then you can come back and read that at your own pace. Now, we've mentioned the mound. Okay. Um, here is a picture of the mound around about 1900 and you can see there is this rather strange looking building on the top. Okay, Now this is described in that um, brochure that I just showed you as a rustic temple. Basically it's a folly, it was, it was just stuck up there. If you go to the top of the mound now there are still a few bricks in the ground which are the foundations of this building. Um, I think it, it became rather unsavoury and was eventually demolished in around about the 1960s, so it's not there anymore. Um, but it is interesting if you look at the lower picture, which was taken again around about the 1900s, um, just how small the trees are. The, the actual mound is itself is much clearer, so the, uh, the trees have grown an awful lot in the last um, you know, hundred years or so. Um, the house, of course, you can see here that the windows, as I said, compared to that original 1830s painting, they're really not quite as tall as, as they, they made out. Um, and there you can see the conservatory on the uh, eastern end at this stage. A few features to look for in the house. One of the things I won't say irritates me because I think it's lovely to have children come into the museum and to have a space for them to do things. And I know the children do love going in and doing the dressing up and so on. Um, but I get slightly disappointed at times when I hear the kitchen described as the children's playroom, um, almost as if, you know, well, adults shouldn't go in there. The kitchen is actually one of the most interesting rooms because, as I showed you, it has been the kitchen since the house was first built. Uh, it's been changed a bit since and certainly there would not have been a range uh, as we have there now which dates to 1900-1910, something like that. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting and a lot of people sort of don't register because it doesn't look terribly exciting, but you can just about see it here behind the clothes horse. To the left of the fireplace there are a couple of big alcoves. Now, my understanding is that when the house was first built, the fireplace would have had open fire in it. And basically, these alcoves were the ovens for make, baking bread. So, you know, you, you, know, you can see that, that um, a lot of the, the original features, if you like, are still there. Um, behind the door, as you go into the kitchen, um, uh, you've got the, uh, the bell for summoning servants. You can see the board on the top right there. Um, this is the electronic version. Uh, if you go to the chair gallery upstairs on the far left, the most eastern end, then there is the fireplace, which I, I, you can see in the picture there. And to the left, I've circled it in yellow, is one of the original bell pushes. Now it doesn't work, I always stress this to children, so they, they, there's no point in pushing it and seeing what happens. But it's still there. You can just about see it in the picture. That's one of the bell pushes that would have triggered the, uh, the, the notice board and the servants would have come. 
And you can see there's what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there's 11 rooms. Um, the other thing I've circled uh, is an outdoor bell, which was there to summon the gardener. The assumption was the gardener uh, would have been outdoors, basically gardening. Um, and so if he was needed, there was a bell to be rung. Um, sadly, the bell disappeared about a year ago, um, but I've still got the picture of, of where it was. Okay. Um, other, other things, uh, and again, it's amazing how many people don't really register it. Bottom left-hand side there, this cool vent, which is sort of into where the toilets are now. This is, was built in when they put that extension on the back of the house for the butler and, and the servants. Um, and as I explained to children, it's basically um, the old Victorian version of a fridge. Um, bearing in mind, it's facing this mound, so it's constantly in shadow, so it's constantly cool. It will never get the sun on it, so it, it's cool. And this is a sort of cast iron vent to keep out all the mice and the birds and the bats and things and inside it would have been a very fine mesh to keep out the insects but to let in the cold air there would have been cold tiles I'm sure some of you may remember certainly I do my grandparents didn't have a fridge they had a larder with cold tiles and that's where they kept everything cool so that cool vent is, is still there um, uh, these days sign of the times um, on the inside we put a complete solid sheet of, of um, perspex of plastic glass because these days the object is to keep the warmth in not to let the cold in um, also in the rear bedroom upstairs when the uh, museum was refurbished they we deliberately left open this square panel which shows you the original so if you remember where we are we're in the what, what i called the northwest corner of the house the back bit on the left hand side which is uh, the most sort of original feature um, and okay that window does face out to the west but you can see all it looks out on is the vegetation growing on the side of the mound so there's just just one or two features um, if ever you do have a reason to go up right into the attic you'll see that there are stoves up there because that was um, staff bedroom basically and these days it's used for storage so uh, you know it's closed unless you really need to get up there um, the owners of the house uh, it's quite difficult to pinpoint um, who owned the house it's even more difficult to pinpoint who owned it and lived in it uh, one name that does crop up a lot excuse me in the 18th century is the wells family now i said castle hill house is not a stately home right there are not lords and ladies who lived here what we've had because it was nevertheless a significant house in the social life of wickham was people who were important in the town so the wells family for example in the 18th century were constantly producing mares there were, there were three Samuels and a Richard, all of whom at some stage served as mayor. Um, there's a reference to a Thomas Perry in 1733, who some say built the house, others say they rented it from the Wellses. I'm, I'm not sure, but he seems to have been one of the earlier people who lived in it. The Wellses got rid of it in 1808, when it was bought by Robert Nash, who, as you can see, he was the town clerk. And he is often described as the first owner occupier of the house. In other words, he bought it and lived in it. I showed you just now the brochure when the house was auctioned in 1833, and it was bought by the Carrington family after Nash died. Um, Another name, John Edwards, this is a name I actually only recently discovered and I discovered it by accident because my wife was singing in a concert in All Saints Church um, and while I was waiting for afterwards I wandered around and there's a little sign there that says that the west window of the church 
was paid for by the widow of John Edwards and dedicated to him. And Mr. and Mrs. Edwards lived in Castle Hill House. So he was a retired wine merchant who lived in the house. And when he died, his window, oh, sorry, his widow, my apologies, dedicated the window to him. Probably the best known name, James Peace. Uh, he was initially a tenant, but then subsequently bought it. As you can see, he was a councillor, a JP, a mayor, a being a freeman of the borough. Um, he was a shopkeeper, if you like. He was a draper. Um, knew, although exactly what the relationship is, we're none too sure, but uh, was aware of uh, another draper who went by the name of John Lewis, uh, of whom we all know. Um, if you go down into the town, you may know this, but if you don't, if you go into the town at the southern end of Frogmore and you turn to face where the church is, on your left there is a building called the Hen and Chickens and it says Hen and Chickens on it. If you look right up at the end gable of the roof, there is the name Peace painted on there. And that relates to James Peace because he would work there. People come up with all sorts of weird ideas, but actually it, uh, it was a uh, building owned and, and where James Peace used to work. So his name is still there in the town. Um, in 1909, he sold the house to his future son-in-law's father. Um, and and, and I, I love having sort of... Um, pictures of, of discussions going on here that um, the, the peace daughter wants to get married so this young man comes and uh, asks um, her father for her hand he says well um, can I be assured that you will uh, that she will be able to live in the uh, style to which she's become accustomed the, the young man ums and ahs a bit, so his father steps in and says, don't worry, I'll buy this house so she can continue living here. Um, whether that conversation actually took place, I have no idea, but effectively that's what happened, right? Um, James Peace's daughter married the Clark family and the Clarks bought the house for the son and uh, daughter to live in. And they were the last family to own the house. Um, and Roland Clark eventually sold it in 1962 to Wickham District Council, um, who moved the museum in temporarily, just, just, just as a temporary measure, so we were told at the time. Okay. Um, this picture here is, is um, interesting. It's a picture not of that wedding, because that wedding, the one I talked about just now, was a few years later. This is a wedding that took place in 1901. And apart from being interesting because it uh, is a wedding that took place in the grounds, the reason it's interesting is that uh, reputedly it was while this wedding was taking place that the Saxon burial was uncovered. Now you may know that a Saxon burial was uncovered that um, some bones were found, some beads were found, and a pendant was found. The pendant is in the British Museum. We have a copy of it. And apparently it was discovered during the celebration of this wedding. Now, that's fine, um, but it is a little bit interesting because we're told that it was discovered by workmen working on the driveway of Castle Hill House. Now just imagine, okay, the driveway of Castle Hill House. If you dig up the driveway as it is now, how do you get in and out? There are all these guests coming in and out. Um, and I was asked this question by, by when I was doing one of these talks. How did everybody get in and out? There's the one entrance, there's the driveway, the workmen were apparently digging up the driveway, you've got all these guests to get in, go to the church, come back again. And how did it work? And why on earth would um, the father of the bride want workmen digging up the driveway during the wedding? Well, 
I wonder, and it is no more than a wonder, but I wonder if we go back to the beginning of this talk, if you remember, I said that the original driveway to Castle Hill House went right the way down to the bottom of Amersham Hill. But after the railway, it went along the northern edge of the railway to Amersham Hill. In other words, where I parked in brown here. I've also said to you that, of course, in around about 1900, 1901-ish, the trackway which on this this map i've got here is still shown as a track was being developed into priory avenue and priory avenue came down where the trackway did hit the railway and carried on all the way along to amersham hill and subsumed it incorporated this stretch of the castle hill house drive from where the gateway is now to Amersham Hill. And I just wonder whether when we say there were workmen working on the driveway, were they actually workmen who were working on the conversion of that stretch of the driveway into Priory Avenue? So was the burial actually where I put the number two rather than traditional view number one, which would of course have meant that there was no problem getting in and out of the house during the wedding because you would have just come out, turned right, and you could have gone down Priory Avenue and Priory Road. I don't know. Um, one of the things I will just mention in passing while we're here, I said to you at the beginning about the mound being a scheduled ancient monument. In fact, if you look at the entry, this 109537, it is actually a joint entry uh, and it is one scheduled monument that incorporates both the Castle Hill so-called Mott and this Saxon burial. The two are lumped together as one entry. So uh, it is it sort of, it is its bet, it just says, the Saxon burial um, where Castle Hill Drive is or was. So, you know, we're not sure. But I do just wonder whether this, this conundrum about did they really dig up the drive during the middle of the wedding might be sold if we move to position number two. The problem is we don't know. Like so much of what I'm telling you this evening about the exact extent of the grounds and the mots and where, we don't know where it is. Apparently the bones were buried back in the ground. The beads have vanished uh, and the only thing we know is that the pendant is in the British Museum. Okay. The last extension on the house, the last change made, was just over 100 years ago when they extended it. Now of course you can't extend it to the west because that's where the mound is in this ridiculously close position to the house. Okay they did put that little lean to extension on but they did extend it to the east and it, uh, the extension to the east this was the point at which the east wall of the original house was was removed to make the the rooms much bigger um, and so you can see that actually you have this slightly lopsided view you've got the doorway but only one set of windows to the left and two sets to the right um, one way you can tell it's it's not very clear on this picture if you look fairly closely you'll see that the original front bit the bit that was put on 200 years ago, um, with the, with flint is very gray the flint is gray and the mortar holding it together is pale gray whereas what was ex well, what was added um, in 1909 is actually quite brown the flint is brown and certainly the mortar is brown if you look very closely at this picture, you, you can perhaps make it out. Um, I can see it because I know it's there. Um, but if you are outside the building, it's very obvious, which is the brown bit. So that was the last uh, extension to, to the house. Um, and that is, of course, what we have now. And it has been the museum since 1962. Um, this is a talk with lots of I don't knows and, and maybes and possibilities so uh, I can't really finish without having another I don't know we're none too sure possibilities and that is this 
head on the side of the house. Um, we don't know who it is. Uh, if you look closely, uh, it wears a tricorn hat and it has a date of 1777, um, but no name. So who it was, uh, whether he died in 1777 or what, um, I don't know. It's, it's in the form of a death mask. So presumably, presumably he died in 1777. Um, but that then raises the question of why is it on that part of the house that didn't exist until about 50 years later, well into the 19th century, by when the, the, the front was added. Uh, was it perhaps on the old part of the building and moved? I don't know. I don't know. It is a complete mystery. Um, but if anybody ever comes across anyone who says, oh, my great, 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 so-and-so, uh, he's the bloke who's on the side of Castle Hill House, we would love to know. But in the meantime, it remains yet another of the Castle Hill House mysteries. Uh, at which point, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found something interesting. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Keith. That was brilliant. I um, I got a little bit lost halfway through. I seem to have left the <laughs> left the meeting, but I, I it was I managed to get back in. So thank you for that. That was so interesting. Um, I was looking at one of your original slides, and um, on one of the original slides, uh, we David was doing the gardener was doing some work at the beginning of the, um, just before lockdown happened really, and uh, for, for preparing us for the weddings we had this year. And he actually reopened the kind of moon shape of the flint uh, little flower beds, which was in that, uh, one of those original pictures. Yeah. And I thought that was amazing um, that, that we, it's still there and it's still got that shape and it just looks, it, it just looked brilliant. Um, and so I was thinking we should, we'll have to reopen the, the trouble is there's so many things I, I, I could say. Um, I, I did uh, at one stage toy with the idea of putting a picture. I was talking about the mound being a mot. Um, there's a fascinating little diagram in the Bayer Tapestry of one of these mots being built, which, which is, is, is fascinating. But you know, there's a limit as to how much uh, <laughs> you can show and cover. <laughs>